and joining us now to discuss peace in the face of tragedy, Dr. Isildine Abulaish from the School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. It's a great pleasure to meet you. Thanks for coming in tonight. Thank you. Let's just tell people a little more about your background. You're a Palestinian, right? Yes. You were raised where? I was born, raised, and still living till before coming to Toronto in the Jabalia refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. In the Gaza Strip. You practice medicine in Israel? Yes. So you speak Arabic and Hebrew? Yes. Your Hebrew is pretty good. I heard you speaking some earlier. Why not? <laughs> well, because it's hard to learn a second language sometimes. Yeah, you know, but if there is a will, there is a way. That is true. How did you get involved in the first place in promoting peace? You know, peace is important. It's a good word that we use it. Even I think you use it. Can you define peace to me? What is peace? Well, let's start by saying it's an absence of hostility. That would be a good place so to start. So I think it's negative, something negative. Why not to be positive? Peace is a humanity. Peace is respect. Peace is dignity. Peace is justice and equality. And that's what do we want. OK. Until recently, as you pointed out, you were living in the Gaza Strip before moving to Toronto. Um, how worried were you for your, the safety of yourself and your family while you were living there? I'm living in Gaza. I was born. This is my people. This is my life where I felt the suffering, the pain of the Palestinian people and the human being as you are. And I feel my belonging and my loyalty to those people. So that's why, in spite of the suffering, I felt belonging to those people and I have to do something positive for them but we hear and others. We hear it's one of the worst places in the world to live. You live there. Is it this is man-made. And that's what we have to find, the cause behind that. It's man-made. Once it's man-made, it can be reversed and reverted and it changed. And that's the question. Why is this happening in this part of this world? You must, as Stephen, defend the rights of those human beings who are suffering, not just to interview why is this suffering? Why is this happening there? You must stand up and speak loudly, louder. Why is this happening? And to defend them. Well, I, okay, we're giving you a platform to do that because you know about this. But so also, we are sharing a humanity, and you share them a humanity. You are Canadian, I am Palestinian, others are American, but we are human. And your humanity brings all of us together, and we must stand up, all of us in one voice, to defend a humanity that all of us belongs to. You've, you've experienced, though, some things in your life that, that so many people in this world, thank God, never have to go through. And I want to take you back to that day in January when your world just changed. I guess that's the best way to put this. What happened on that day? It didn't change. It changed only I faced the tragedy. And just four months before, I faced the first tragedy when I lost my wife. How did she die? She died of acute leukemia and suddenly, just two weeks, 16th of September 2008, a quarter to five. And my daughters were killed. 16th of January, 2009, quarter to five. As a believer, as a Muslim with deep faith, I fully believe that everything from God is for good. But what is bad is man-made. As a physician, my job helped me a lot. That I am dealing with patients. I am not dealing with dead. And I have to invest my time in saving lives. It's a waste of time to invest in someone who is dead. I understand. But your, your wife died of medical reasons. Your children did not die of medical yes, reasons. Yes. So I have to prevent that. We must focus on prevention, not the treatment. Okay. But peop, uh, peop, for those who don't know, your children died because the Israeli Defense Forces bombed the home in which they were living. Yeah. That's the issue. There are, and there were girls who were full of dreams, of hope, of love. They were soldiers. How old were they? My eldest daughter, who was Bisan, she was 20 years old. She was the mother, the sister, the friend for her brothers and sisters who lost their mom. And your second daughter? Mayar, who was 15 years old, who dreamed to be a doctor, and I was happy. At least one of my daughters will follow my path. And your third Aya, daughter? 
who was 14, who dreamed to be a journalist. And I am sure if they were alive, they will fulfill their dreams. They never succeeded less than 95% in their school. My daughter Shada, who was severely wounded, imagine someone to lose his mother at the beginning of the school year. After four months, three sisters to be lost, and she is severely wounded and to stay in the hospital four months. But she was determined, and she looked forward. She must challenge those life challenges, and she went for the high school exams with all of the difficulties and succeeded 95.5. Hmm. And now she's studying computer engineering at UFT. You must be very proud of that. I am proud. And it is an inspiring message to all of us. Tragedies don't stop us from continuing our life. We must challenge and make a positive difference, not to be stuck there with our pain and the grief. What was particularly distinctive about your tragedy, if I may put it that way, is that it happened on live television. You were on the telephone with, uh, I guess, with an, an Israeli newscaster. And, well, you know what? This speaks for itself. Roll the tape, please. What impact did that telephone call have in Israel? I was supposed to be interviewed. Shlomi is my friend. He used to call me twice, three times a day to ask about the situation in Gaza. He doesn't know because this war was a secret and no one knows about the suffering of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. But this came to disclose the secret and to open the eyes of the Israeli public. What are we doing? This face is well known to us. We heard his voice, we saw his face. What is he doing? Where are we going and what are we doing? At some point in that interview, he said, uh, tell me where you are. I want to be able to tell anybody from the Israeli Defense Forces who are watching to send an ambulance or to go help you. Did anything like that happen? You know, I was in my house with my children, with my brothers, with my nephews, and no one was there. Only the Israeli army were there. It took us more than an hour walking because we were scared. We can't move and leave our house. Uh, the and we went to the Palestinian hospital mm -hmm. and from the Palestinian hospital to be transferred to the Israeli hospital. Because I realized from the first moment when I saw my daughter Shada, her eye on her cheek and her fingers just as tasked attached by a tag of skin. What will happen in Gaza? She will be blind and disabled. With the abilities of the Gaza health system, they can't cope with these cases. And that's what we have to look at. My niece, Gaida, who was dead, thanks to God, and my son, Muhammad, who told me, Gaida took a breath. I thought that she is killed with my daughters, and she was hopeless. And that's what do we want to focus on saving lives. In the hospital where she was treated, in Tel HaShomer Hospital, where I used to work, where Palestinian patients and Israeli patients share their sickness, their pain, their life. Can we practice what doctors practiced within the borders of hospitals? And leaders learn from that to practice outside what is practiced inside the hospital. I Equality, will, justice, privacy and respect, and to save lives. I will follow up on that, but I, I, I do want to get a better understanding. The IDF said the shelling of your home 
which killed so many members of your family, was an accident. Do you accept that explanation? It's not important for me, really, without an accident intentionally. But what is important, to admit that, to speak about the truth, we must be honest without falsification. It was painful at the first to start falsification and to find excuses that there were snipers. The second day, there were militants inside the room. The third day, there, were f there was firing from the surrounding and the most painful. And that's what I can say. It's immoral and unethical to stab someone who is dead. To say that they took shrapnels from my knees and they were examined and found it was from Kassam rockets. But at the end, truth came clear like the sun that they admitted their responsibility about chilling the house. It's not important with that intentionally or by incident. They will never come back. Have we learned from that to prevent it and to avoid it? Here's a key question, though, I think. Given what happened to you, how can you not hate Israel or Israelis? I never hated a person. I know. Why not? Because I fully believe, as a physician, as a human being, hatred is a disease, is a poison, is detrimental to human being. And I don't think any one of us wants to be poisoned. No, that's fine. But this that... is one thing. The other thing, I have other children. I have other people. If I want to make a difference, a positive difference, I must be healthy. I understand that. But healthy is something presumably you get to after you have gone through the embitterment, the hatred, the, the I mean, it's, did you not go through a period of time where you just hated the I, other side? I never hated anyone, and I will never hate a human being. I hate the sin, not the sinner. Why do you think you're that way? Because obviously many people on both sides are not that way. And that's our responsibility. To let those people adopt these new values, these are the saving to all of our people. And we must think of that. Hatred. Even my son, he asked me if they brought you the soldier who killed and chilled my sisters. I said to him, if he asked me, do whatever you want. Is it going to return my daughters? No. I think when his conscience wakes up, God bless him to be with him, with his pain, with his thinking. When he has a children, and to understand what is the meaning of losing a child, how can he run his life? This is the punishment. So I don't want to add more. I understand. Do you, and obviously, um, to a much uh, smaller extent in terms of numbers, there are Israeli families who have been victimized by suicide bombers and rocket shelling from Gaza, they have experienced some of what you have experienced as well. Have you met with those families and shared your grief with them? No, you know, I, I don't want to feel that I am victim. I am doing, I have my children to do, I have my people, I have my work. Not to stay in pain and grief and to feel victim. I am beyond that. I crossed it and I passed it. I want to grieve to change that into positive action. To give hope, to inspire people. Please, stand up, wake up, make a positive difference. And that's what do we want. Not to start, just to complain our pains. Our pains must be an energizer to us to look forward. And that's what do we need. How many Palestinians do you think share your view that we need to get beyond victimhood, that we need to really take concrete steps for peace? The majority of the Palestinians are looking to live in dignity and respect no, and I equality with that. others. I, I... The majority of the Palestinians, they are willing that. And if we want, if we search them, go to Gaza, even this place, which is stigmatized by suffering, if you went there and did an interview with the majority of them, you will find the same thickness. Well, oh, I know they all want to live so, in dignity and they, and they want peace, but how many of them don't hate Israelis, as you obviously do not? 
you can find some of them, but some of them even, the majority of whom who worked in Israel, and they have relations with Israelis, they don't hate the Israelis as Israelis, as I said. They hate the sins, the actions of what is happening, this craziness, and we must avoid and to prevent this craziness. So I appreciate the fact that you are out, you are meeting people, you are speaking, you are giving interviews, you are trying to proselytize for peace right now. Um, can one person make a difference over, you know, what are many, 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 many years of war and enmity and distrust and hatred? Can you make a difference? I fully believe in that. Everything, my daughter Bisan, she said, everything starts small, then becomes big. Everything starts in one place, then spread in different places. These are my children and other children. Have we learned from them? I think this message, if it found listening ears, minds, and hearts, it will have an impact. But as you look, you know, you, 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 I'm sure, watch television, listen to the radio, read newspapers and magazines as much as anybody as to what's going on in the Middle East. What is happening there right now that gives you the sense that what you believe has a chance to come true? How long do we go with our craziness? Well, apparently longer. I mean, longer. It's been on it for a long years, time. 60 years in the history is not that long. And even from what have we learned in the history, in short period, within the last 10 years, the events that happened, we never dreamed in. And it happened. No one dreamed that the president of the states will be black man. And now he is President Obama. So I think everything can happen. And I don't believe in impossible things. The only impossible thing is to return my daughters back. Other thing that I planned in my life, I succeeded to achieve. Did, did you feel at all, I mean, it's wonderful you're here in Toronto, don't misunderstand my question here, but did you feel at all guilty leaving uh, Gaza, given that you've led your whole life there, your my, people are there? My mind, my heart with my people there, and from here, I am with them and they are with me, and I'm working for them. I established a foundation here to help the Gazans, in particular, the Palestinian girls and women in general, and the Middle East to help them. I will be in Gaza 11th of January. It will be one year after the tragedy. I will be there, and from here, I can make a positive difference that helps the Palestinians and the Israelis. I got to follow up on that because. Um you know, everybody admires what you're doing. I've seen your speeches before. Uh, what you're saying, the message you are conveying, it's admirable, given, uh, particularly given what you've gone through. It's incredible. But, you know, nobody lost money betting on bad things happening in the Middle East, right? You pick up the paper every other day, it's something new, something new and something bad that's yes. happening there. Um, where does this optimism come from? Because it sure doesn't seem that it comes from the facts on the ground. This optimism for me, as a physician, I never lose hope as long as the patient is alive. How far is the critical his situation is. And I think you learned and you heard many patients who were hopeless and they were dying. And then their lives were saved. So if the patient is Middle East peace, what condition is the patient in today? It's our leader, it's a critical. So we need action. It's a matter of action, not just wars. And I say to both of us, when I say both of us, Palestinians and Israelis, and we must change our course, our treatment. If we didn't succeed in saving the patient, we must do evaluation. Why we didn't? Can we change the treatment? Can we adopt a new course of a treatment? And it's time for actions, especially for the Israeli leadership to take actions. I am against any violence. Military ways or any violence from both sides will never lead 
to any way. It's a futile. It's a futile and proved its failure between Palestinians and Israelis. It only succeeds to increase hatred, animosity, and the bloodshed. Agreed. So we must, so we must adopt a new way. I, I, to I admit the rights of all, and when I say all, Palestinians and Israelis, to live in harmony, in respect, and collaboration and partnership. Uh, Dr. Abulaysh, I hear what you're saying, but it seems to me the trouble in the Middle East is that maybe 80%, maybe 90% of the people in the middle agree with what you're saying. But the 10 or 20% on the fringes are the people who seem to carry the day. They are the people who, um, you know, who blow up the bombs and who get out of control on both sides. And as long as they are carrying the day, what hope does your message yeah, have? Yeah, the 90% that you said, willingness and talking and uh, wanting something is not enough. They must act. They must speak louder and express that, not to speak in closed rooms. They must translate into action. And the Palestinians, especially in the Gaza Strip, they are suffering. The Israeli government, they must take actions. So what does that mean? Take actions against what? Against what is happening. To admit the rights of all to live in equality, in justice and respect. That's all. Okay. We, must, we must, first of all, the settlements. We must take action against that. Well, you've got a freeze in place right now. I don't know. Well, you do. Netanyahu said so. He said. Yeah. There's, as, as I said, wars are good, but ne we need these wars to be translated into action. Is no. it real or not? I don't know. Mm -hmm. that. And the other thing, to proceed in the peace process, in implementation, and we must work together to achieve that. It's a joint project. It's a joint project. Not one's obligation and the other side is not. It's a joint project for Palestinians and Israelis if we want to achieve one goal, to live. Okay, but let, let, let's take things at, at, at the simplest level. At, at the very basic level, the Palestinian leadership somehow needs to prevent suicide bombings from continuing. At the simplest level, the Israeli leadership needs to prevent some of their you know, right-wing fanatics from wanting to expel all Palestinians uh, out of, uh, you know, everywhere. Um, you know, how is that possible? We need challenging leaders and risk takers. Do we have them? If they are not, it's our responsibility, those leaders, who brought them? You and me. If we are serious and willing to make a difference, we must select to have the right selection of the right leaders who can take the risk and to challenge the current situation and to give a better hope for the people. Let me ask you one more thing about this before I, I uh, start asking you about your time here in Canada. And that is um, there are, I think, more and more voices who have experience in this region of the world who are now saying the best thing the rest of the world can do, particularly in the United States, to bring peace to the Middle East is to get the hell out of there. You know, 40, 50 years of American engagement in the Middle East has not brought peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Let's wash our hands of it. Let's leave it to them to figure out, and maybe they can do better. Do you think that's the right way to go? I can say to you as a physician, when dealing with a patient, I must take history, symptoms, signs, investigation, treatment. Why did they reach that point? They must ask themselves and do self-evaluation why they didn't succeed. This is the question. And you must ask this question to them, why you didn't succeed? What's the answer? Why do you think it hasn't succeeded? Ask them and they know the answer and you know the answer. It's good now even all of the people in this world, their eyes are focused towards the White House. President Obama is their hope. He promised, I hope, these promises to be achieved. But some people say his getting more involved in it is not going to help. The best thing the U.S. can do is get out of the way and force the Israelis and the Palestinians to deal with each other. Even if they are foregoing to get 
We need someone to mediate, to facilitate, to help. And who can to do bring that? It. Americans, Canadians, anyone who is sincere and caring can bring them together and not to be biased. We don't want someone to be pro-Palestinians. Once he is pro-Palestinian, this means he's anti-Israelis. Once he is pro-Israelis, he's anti-Palestinians. We need someone who cares and facilitates. Okay, let me ask you about here. You left one of the worst places in the world, and uh, if I may say, you've come to one of the best places in the world, in Toronto, Canada. Why did you come to Toronto? Uh, it's one of the worst places in the world, in one aspect of the craziness which is induced by people. That's the Gaza you're talking but, about. But, yes, the Gaza Strip, but it's the beautiful place in nature and its people. I came to Canada, as I got an offer from the University of Toronto. At the beginning, I was supposed to come here before the tragedy. After the tragedy, I didn't think to come. Even my daughters, they said, no, we don't want to leave. So my colleagues here at UFT asked me to come to see the place. When I came, I realized it may be a good place. I explained it to my children, and they accepted it. And when I came, I can say to you, one of my wisest decisions in life that I decided to come to Canada. I am so satisfied about it. I found every good thing from the people here, even from the first day when my daughter, Rafa, who's 10 years old, she asked about the children. She wants to meet with the children. She knocked the door of our neighbors, and she met with their children. Our neighbor, he came in the afternoon at 3 o'clock, Zildin, in the backyard. We want our children to mix together. We must take part of the wooden fence. And that's the message. Can we learn from what has been practiced in Canada to smash the mental and physical barriers within us and between us? We should point out, you lost three children on that awful day back in January. You have five children who now live with you here yes. in Canada. How are they adapting to a very different world from where they came? They're very happy, fully engaged, in the school, if you go there, one of my daughters, Rafa, she's in Morris Cody, and her brother, Abdallah. Muhammad, he's in Hudson School. Dalal, studying civil engineering at the University of Toronto. Shada, computer engineering at the University of Toronto. They're so happy and even challenged the situation, determined to succeed, and that's what I told them. This country opened the arms and hearts to us and its ethical value to return part of that to the people who gave us that. And they assured me to do that. I want to be careful how I ask this. Your idea of a potential peace in the Middle East is a very dangerous idea to the lunatic fringe on both sides, right? There are, yes. there are people who have a lot of, there's an expression, skin in the game to keep the violence going. Do, do you worry uh, about your own safety still? In our life, we face risks. Crossing the road is risky. Yeah, what you're doing is riskier than crossing the road. Yes, I know that. If you are not confident in what you are doing, you will never move one centimeter. You are doing something that is a human, that is saving lives. And this is the only way to challenge these risks. And I think once you have sincere belief in what you are doing, I fully believe that God will be with me and with others who are going to join. You think you will see peace in the Middle East in your lifetime? As I see you, I am confident with goodwill and sincere efforts, we can make it as soon as possible. Thank you for coming in and talk to, talking to us today. And um, there's an expression, uh, from your lips to God's ears, right? Thank you so much. Let's hope that happens. And let us work for that. Thank you, Dr. Abelaj. Thank you.